this is what people think of when they think of linear perspective. They see blocks and charts and lines and measurements and rulers. And I can tell you as somebody who hates all of those things, this just makes me want to cry. <laughs> and I get to insult this chart because I made this chart myself. <laughs> so anyway, oh, hello, 10,000 crows. Thank you for joining us. I would love to hear from all of you in the chat. What is your take on linear perspective? Do you love it? Do you hate it? Do you feel like you don't understand it? Because I would like to make linear perspective fun for you guys, because it does not have to be boring. And it does not have to be cubes and lines and rulers. It can be a million more different types of things. For example, there are some really cool contemporary artists out there working with linear perspective. And I think a lot of people think about linear perspective is all about accuracy and it's all about measuring. And sure, the linear perspective is accurate in this drawing by Antonio Lopez Garcia. But ultimately, Antonio Lopez Garcia, his pieces are very emotional. And actually, the linear perspective almost takes a back seat. Another contemporary artist, Anselm Kiefer, you would not think somebody who paints with this level of texture and tactility could do something that had linear perspective, and yet he does. Or even somebody like Piranesi from a million years ago who did these breathtaking pieces. You might think that these are so accurate and precise, but they're actually not. And he was able to really mess with linear perspective because he was an architect for a long time, knew it inside out, and knew exactly what he needed to do to manipulate that. So basically, guys, let's make this more fun, <laughs> okay? Because cubes and lines, I'm just not into that, okay? So the question is, how do you get from all the cubes and the terminology to, let's just say, Magneto in a bar in Argentina? I don't know if you guys have seen this movie. This is from X-Men First Class. Young, hot Magneto. He looks really good in the scene. But anyway, I feel like for a lot of people, linear perspective, you can understand the mechanics of it. Like you could ask somebody, oh, what's a vanishing point? And they could probably explain it to you. But the thing is, how do you take all of that technical information and translate it into an image that actually has a story or feeling or a type of emotion to it? That is what I think is so hard. And actually, guys, I think it's really similar to anatomy because with anatomy, again, you can have people who can name every single bone in the body and they know where every single muscle is. And yet you ask them to do a figure drawing that has life and emotion and they can't do it. It ends up looking so sterile and stiff. So in my opinion, linear perspective is a similar issue. It's like, how do you make that leap from the anatomical chart to <laughs> Michael's Hector Alice Major. It's a good thing we're not doing torsos today because it's a little bit distracting. Anyway, I want to give you some core concepts that are applicable just to the idea of perspective because before you dig into the mechanics, you have to know what mindset you got to take on linear perspective. So the first thing that I think you should know about linear perspective is that it's right or wrong, okay? There's no in-between and it's the one thing I can really think of in visual arts that is correct or incorrect. Pretty much everything else in visual art is completely subjective. So linear perspective, it's very much an anomaly in that sense. For example, Michael Fassbender is right for me. James McAvoy is not. He's cute. He's fine. He's got a really good Scottish action, accent, and that's sort of charming, but he's just not right for me. He's wrong for me. So yeah, that, think about it that way. It's like some things are right and some things are wrong. Linear perspective, really when it comes down to it, if you just forget about all the mechanics, it's about showing a specific point of view. So what you need to think about when you look at a linear perspective image is where am I in the scene, okay? Am I a bird that's on the ceiling? Am I ant? that's looking upwards? Am I somebody who's a lot taller than somebody else? Am I with Magneto and Professor Xavier? <laughs> so that's what you have to think about because none of that stuff, vanishing point and all that stuff, it does not matter if you don't understand this idea 
of showing a scene from a particular point of view. Hello, Galvin W. I'm guessing you like my slides. I know they're way better than those like blocks because before I prepared this lecture, I went on YouTube and I just looked up linear perspective videos and I just like wanted to cry. I was like, okay, this is why people hate linear perspective because it just sounds so awful. Like it, it's like going to the dentist. It's like, who wants to do that? Anyway, we're going to try to make this more fun because sometimes the visuals can uh, help out quite a bit. Okay, so let's start with a basic concept, which is the horizon line, okay? The thing about the horizon line to know is that it's a perfect horizontal. It never goes up or down. It never changes. In fact, my best example of what a horizon line is, is I remember when I was in seventh grade, we won in this whale watch and it, it was one of those whale watches where just everybody was like puking their brains out. It was really, really bad. And I had like terrible seasickness and wanted to puke, but couldn't puke, which is almost worse than puking. Anyway, I remember I was with one of my teachers and he said, oh, well, some people feel that if they look at the horizon line, it stabilizes them because the horizon line is so constant. So no matter how rocky the boat got, the horizon line would stay. And that's really how you want to think about the horizon line is that it's like the foundation for everything. So you've got to get that horizon line in. And really the horizon line, it's more than just a line, okay? It's this concept of space that just keeps going and going and going. Like you can't see the end of that space. You don't know where it goes. And so it's really sort of deep if you think about it, like this infinite space that just continues. And really, it's something which you can think about if you go to the beach. It's where the sky meets the ocean, wherever that happens to be, wherever you are on the beach. Although it does make me very sad that Michael Fassbender is on a beach, but he's wearing a helmet. That's really disappointing because, you know, there's other clothing you could wear or not wear at the beach that I think would be way more fun. But that's really what it is. So if you think about a beach and you say, there's the sky, there's the ocean, where do they meet? There you've got your horizon line. That is the basic concept behind that. Okay, now the thing about the horizon line, it is also the viewer's eye level, okay? So if I pretend that I'm in this like padded jail cell with Magneto, I don't know why I am. Anyway, I'm in this jail cell with him. I am actually standing there and that is my eye level. That's how I would see that room. So for example, if this is me and that's my eye level, compared to Magneto, he's a lot taller than me. And so this is where those relationships are really important because you can't just think about your point of view. You have to think about, okay, well, I'm looking at the seed. What is my relationship with Magneto? Although I hate this costume. This costume is really, really hideous. Can't even like see his face. It really stinks. Anyway. When you get the horizon line and you say, okay, horizon line is the same thing as my of eye level. You want to divide them into what is above my eye level and what is below my eye level. So if I want to look at the ceiling, I have to look up. Therefore, it's above my eye level. If I want to look at a rug on the floor, that's below my eye level. So that is another role that the horizon line plays, that it, it divides the space. Because really, that's what linear perspective is. It's a way to understand and organize the space. By the way, those of you who are watching, if you guys have any questions, feel free to let me know in the chat. I'm happy to go back and re-explain. And I'd also like to hear, have any of you guys been taught linear perspective in school? Or have you tried to teach it to yourself? And has it been successful or not successful? Because in my experience as a teacher, a lot of people really don't understand it or they tried it and were super frustrated and therefore hate it now. Anyway, I don't tend to hear a lot of good things about linear perspective. It's just one of those subjects that people just really do not like very much. Okay, so let's give an example. Above eye level versus below eye level. So my eye level in this scene, it's actually Michael Fassbender's eye level. Okay, so see how he's like down low and then we have Natalie Portman on the right and she's up above. So let's just stick in the horizon line. 
That's my eye level. Who knows? Maybe I'm having lunch with him, actually. <laughs> that would be nice. I've got to get rid of Natalie Portman. <laughs> she's sort of interfering right now. So Natalie Portman, she's above me and Michael's <laughs> eye level. I have to look up if I want to look at Natalie Portman, which I don't. So maybe I'm not going to look up. But if I want to look at Michael's arm, it's below my eye level. So I have to look down to see his arm. And so that's the thing about all these mechanics is you can understand what they are. But I think when you make them more concrete as far as what you're looking at, that really helps out a lot. Because too often I find people try to teach linear perspective with shapes and it just feels too abstract for people. I think it's too hard to say, oh, this cube, which you could care less about, is above you. Like, who cares? Like, I want to know, okay, who's my competition with Michael Fassbender? Who's in the way? And how do I get rid of them? So in this case, if I was having lunch with Michael and stupid Natalie Portman comes by, I'm, I'm like, okay, don't come here. We're having lunch. Leave us alone. So I need to identify her. And I've identified now that Natalie Portman is above my eye level. Okay, let's talk about this lovely thing, the vanishing point, which you absolutely need. Thank goodness there are all these like really cool photos of hallways from Assassin's Creed, which by the way, was the most horrible movie. Never ever watch that movie. I thought I was gonna be able to get through it. I couldn't. I stopped after like a half an hour. Galvin is saying in the chat, I love the way you give these examples on the lesson. It's so much easier to understand. <laughs> Great, I'm so glad to hear that because it's not linear perspective's fault that people have mistreated it and given it this terrible reputation. It does not have to be that boring. Let's see, Matt Cross is saying, well, threatened by Natalie. Well, I mean, she's like in the scene with Michael and I just want to wipe out any shred of competition I might have. Okay, so in this case, let's just find the horizon line. So it looks like in this scene, if I'm walking down the hall and I run into Jeremy Irons and Michael Fassbender, I'm a little shorter than them. That makes sense because I'm a pretty short person. Okay, now, the vanishing point, it's always on the horizon line. It doesn't go for a walk. It doesn't move down. It's always on the horizon line. That's very important because sometimes people change things up and you just got to like burn into your brain that the vanishing point is always on the horizon line. 10,000 Crows is saying, I want someone to look at me the way Prof looks at Michael Fassbender. Oh, 10,000 Crows, this is only the face I make for the public. <laughs> there are other facial expressions that uh, are uh, not, not available for public view. <laughs> well, I, I hope you follow through on that dream someday, 10,000 Crows, because that's going to be a great day. <laughs> okay. So the whole thing about the vanishing point, it's basically the intersection of all the vanishing lines. It's where everything converges, comes together. Okay, so now we have the vanishing point on the horizon line, and now we have vanishing lines. Okay, so it's like the vanishing point is it's like the most popular place. It's like where everybody wants to be. It's like some cool, awesome place, and that's where everybody converges and wants to hang out. That's probably why the vanishing point is so special because it's so popular, right? Okay. Now, the other thing to remember about vanishing lines is that they represent parts of the scene that are parallel to each other. Now, if you don't know what parallel means, parallel lines are basically lines that never touch each other. So if you have lines that are converging, eventually they're gonna touch each other, okay? Parallel lines never ever do. They're just up and down like this. You could have them going this way. And so this would be like if I was parallel to Michael, that would be very sad. I don't know why. Maybe I'm like doing a demo and for the sake of my students, I want to demonstrate. Actually, no, nah, forget it. <laughs> I think I would sacrifice that moment of art ed just for this. But so basically what I'm saying is that these vanishing lines, the green ones that I was showing you earlier, these are all parallel. And I know it's confusing because in the image I'm showing you, they converge. So you're going, well, hang on. I don't understand. How can they be parallel if they converge? It's just the appearance of them makes them look like they converge. Let's break this down 
a little bit more so that we've got some examples. Because it's one thing to think about what something might look like, and it's another thing to actually be in the scene and really observing something from a very specific point of view. Because remember, that's what linear perspective is about. It's all about where are you in the scene? Okay, so for example, this is from a actually really upsetting movie. It's called Hunger. It's by Steve McQueen. I mean, it's it's very important and it deals with all this history in Ireland, but it's it's really like not fun to watch in that way. But there is this scene where he has this very like very focused conversation with this other guy. Anyway, in this scene, you've got three tables. Okay, so this is one point perspective. We're only going to do one point today because guess what? Two point and three point. Oh my goodness. Whole other can of worms. <laughs> and I think I'm going to have to take more screenshots because wow, it was hard to find three point perspective. I was like, oh my God, I might have to like buy Assassin's Creed because that might be the only movie that has three point perspective in it. So basically, if you put in the horizon line, the vanishing lines, and you see them converge, do you guys see how the table that Michael is sitting at? Because of the perspective, the table looks like a trapezoid. But the thing is, the real table itself is not a trapezoid. We know from looking at your average everyday table that for the most part, tables tend to be rectangles, they tend to be squares, and rectangles and squares are all created out of parallel lines. So what we're seeing on the left, that's what the actual shape of the table is, and the shape on the bottom right, that's what the shape looks like to us because we are in the linear perspective scene. So you have the real shape, versus the perceived shape, the way it looks to you. So if you look at this, you have these two shapes, but they're the same item. They're both the table and they both have parallel lines. It's just that the one on the right, they don't look parallel, but they are in real life. And that's what I mean when I say that these lines actually are parallel. So what you need to do if you guys are going to construct a scene with linear perspective, my thought is to put yourself in the scene. Ask yourself, who am I in the scene? Am I a bird that's flying by? Am I a stalker? Because that's totally what I would do. <laughs> if Michael Fassbender was in Washington, D.C., I'd be like, I'll be there in a heartbeat. So where are you in the scene? For me, maybe I'm like hanging out with them. Maybe I'm or I don't know, maybe I'm a third wheel to their stupid chess game that they're always playing. Although I do like their chess games because, I don't know, Magneto has a really nice soft voice. <laughs> so that's very helpful. So you have to say, where am I in the scene? Okay, let's put me in the scene. I'm going to show you guys. This is how easy it is. Just put yourself there. Okay, so here's the thing. There's a problem because now James McAvoy is around. Okay, he's not a threat like Natalie Portman, but he's problematic. So we got to get rid of him. He's nice. That's fine. But we'll, we'll take care of it. So if I'm in the scene, basically as the viewer, if you're somebody looking at this image, you are seeing the scene through my eyes. Okay. So does everybody see how I lined up where my eyes are with the horizon line, which remember is the same thing as the eye level. And then we have the monument in Washington, D.C. And do you guys see how James McAvoy, he's like sitting down a lot lower. Magneto is standing up a lot higher. And so you can see because James McAvoy, he's sitting under the horizon line. He is below my eye level. So if I need to look at James McAvoy, I don't know why. Maybe I just want to keep an eye out on him, make sure he doesn't do anything. I am looking down to see him. Now, Magneto, he's sort of at my eye level. I can, I can do that. that. That's totally okay with me. Okay, now the thing that's tricky about some linear perspective situations is that the vanishing point is not always in the image. In fact, sometimes, especially with two-point perspective, oftentimes the vanishing point is like way, way off. And it's like six feet away from everything else in the drawing. 
And so what you need to do is really expand the image. So that way you have enough space to actually find the vanishing point. So this is a very extreme point of view. Like I would have to be three inches tall to actually be in the scene because I'm like looking way, way up at him. And I'll show you guys how that works. So next, you can see if I go in and I put in the vanishing lines, the green lines, you can see that the horizon line, which is my eye level as somebody in the scene, it's really low. I mean, it's like probably by his knees or something. And so that's how you get these very extreme points of view, which is what makes movies really fun. I think that's one of the reasons why people enjoy movies is because you get to walk around the scene, you get to go up and above, you get to follow the camera. And so I actually have to tell you guys, I don't know why we're learning linear perspective only from Raphael and the Renaissance paintings, because I feel like movies are so good for linear perspective. Like there's always some super dramatic hallway or there's usually some airplane people are in. I mean, it's like chock full of linear perspective. Plus, you know, we have some people to keep us occupied at the same time. So look at this. If I'm in the scene, I'm not a normal person. Either I shrunk down to like 10 inches or maybe I'm a duck. Who knows? I don't know why I'm hanging out with Magneto, but maybe I'm in the scene. The whole point is that you have to think about your relationship as a viewer to the scene. And so we're really, really down low looking up at Magneto. Okay. And by the way, there's other clues that you can tap into. So yes, you can look at the vanishing point and the horizon line and all that stuff. But the thing is, if you just look at the image, you don't even do the linear perspective. You can tell that he's above you because you're looking up at the ceiling. The only way that that would be the case is if you are down low and looking up. And then even things like this, like the fact that when you look up at him, you can see his really nice chin. <laughs> he's got a nice chin. And that chin would not be visible. So if I were eye level with Magneto, it would be a completely different story. So don't just rely on the architecture and the actual linear perspective. There's other clues. And so that's what I'm trying to show is that linear perspective is just another tool. It's like another pair of scissors and it contributes certain properties to the image, but it's not everything. And I think that's what a lot of people do is it's all about, this is a linear perspective drawing. But if you look at people who really use linear perspective well, linear perspective is just part of the package. It's sort of like if you look at a painting and you say, oh, you've got color, you've got light, you've got shadow, you have line, you have texture. And linear perspective is just another thing to add to your list. So it does not have to be secluded by itself as just a bunch of blocks because that's really boring. Okay, now another thing you can look for in one point perspective is verticals, okay? Because so far we've looked at the horizon line, which is just straight across, that's super easy. And we've looked at the vanishing lines, which are all these super cool diagonals. But the thing is there's all these verticals as well. And the really nice thing about the verticals is that they're always parallel. Remember what parallel is, things that never cross each other. The one exception is that it does change for three point perspective. We're not gonna get into that right now, but the verticals that are parallel, that's only for one point and two point perspective. So that's usually what I do when I look at a scene, I try to spot where the verticals are, and then that just sort of fills in the blanks. Because if you just do the horizon line and the vanishing lines, it's not really enough. Those verticals are really important because seriously, guys, it's like connect the dots. It's just like, oh, this connects to this and this connects to that. It's pretty straightforward when you think about it. It's really not that complex. It's just that you have to understand how to think about it. So I would like to know in the chat, those of you who are watching, who here is afraid of linear perspective? Who here doesn't understand it? Who loves it as much as I love Michael? And who hates it and had a really bad experience? I'm really curious because the funny thing, my experience with linear perspective, I actually never took a class in linear perspective. So I never had training. And so actually, to be honest, don't tell anybody, although I'm telling the whole world right now, 
the first time that I had to teach linear perspective, I didn't know anything about it. They just were like, oh, teach this class. And I'm like, okay, I guess I know what my summer project is. <laughs> so one of the reasons I think I know how to explain it fairly well is because I did have to teach it to myself and I did have to do it wrong a million times. And I really had to run around in circles before I really figured out what was actually useful because there's a lot of bad information out there. And I worked really hard to distill it for my students. Macross is saying, read the other day on Twitter that people in the animation industry just eyeball it. Yeah, you can. I mean, I'll tell you, I don't use rulers. Sometimes I use string and push pins, and I'll show you guys what that looks like at the end of the stream. But honestly, it does not have to be that accurate. I mean, you're not an architect. You're not sending this to an engineer to like build a building. So it really does not matter. And it also depends on your artistic style. I mean, if you're somebody who draws very expressionistically, like Anselm Kiefer, who I showed, it doesn't matter. So I just don't think linear perspective has to be as rigid as people make it out to be. I think it's actually much more flexible and a lot more malleable. Okay, Rugged Lover is saying, I think perspective done well looks nice, but can lead to a stifling mathematical feeling that I usually don't like. Yeah, I think that's what happens when people let the linear perspective dominate. And I think if you look at Antonio Lopez Garcia, who we looked at at the beginning of the stream, he's really good because he combines the linear perspective with really beautiful light and shadow. And so the light and shadow, it, it just takes care of everything. So the linear perspective is there, but the thing is the light and shadow is so much more prominent that the linear perspective doesn't like suck the life out of the drawing. Because I know what you're saying, that can definitely be a trap you can fall into. Okay, so let's find more of these parallel vertical lines. Thank goodness we've got Magneto's bedroom to help us out with that. This is his bedroom in the 1970s, I guess. So you can look for very particular pieces of furniture. You can look for objects. So if you look at the scene, and I'll go back and forth between the other image, you can look at the picture frames. Like you see those three pictures that are sitting above him on the far left? Those have vertical lines in them. If you guys look at the scene and you look at the window panes, those have vertical lines, even something like the edge of the desk. So if you try to give linear perspective more of a name, give it something concrete that you can actually identify, I think number one, it makes it much less clinical. And number two, it's just so much easier to identify what you're actually doing. Danny is asking, do you think that all styles, techniques, and skills of art can be self-taught? since you had to self-teach yourself linear perspective. Is art school beneficial or necessary? Um, Danny, that's a much longer conversation, so I'm going to give you a very quick answer that will sum it up, but honestly, we'd have to talk about that for like another three hours. Um, I mean, I think linear perspective is okay to self-teach because it's very mechanical. It's like, this dot goes here, this line goes here, and unlike other subjects in visual art, it's right or wrong. Like I will say to a student, your perspective is wrong. I'll say, oh, it's correct. I never say that about other stuff. Like if I look at somebody's figure drawing, I don't tell them to correct their figure drawing. I say, I want you to adjust it or I want you to make a change or I want you to shift this. And I think that's a very different mindset. And linear perspective in some ways, it's a little bit refreshing to teach because it is so straightforward. Like I'll just say, yep, right, wrong, blah, blah. So I think the thing about art school, I don't think you have to go to art school, but I do think that if you can, there are big advantages. And honestly, the one that's the biggest is the community. That's really it. Meeting all the teachers, meeting all the students, that is something you can never teach yourself that you cannot recreate on your own. Because the other stuff, yeah, I mean, there's a lot of resources online that you don't have to pay very much or anything at all. I mean, Art Prof is free. And we give you guys a ton of information. So there are things that you can do on your own, but the community that you would get at an art school program, that you can't really reproduce by yourself. Okay, so now that we have found all of those verticals, once we put in the horizon line and the vanishing lines, we can start to match it up with objects and patterns. 
Like for example, here, you'll notice actually that the edge of the bed is the vanishing line. The edge of the picture frame, that's the vanishing line. The edge of the desk, make it concrete. Identify exactly where that is. Don't think about linear perspective as just an abstract concept because that is really, I think, when things become just way too confusing. Let's see, Rugged Lover saying in the chat, I think a lot of importance of an art environment is in crit community environments. Can be hard to find yourself in the context of other artists in isolation. Yep, really well said. I think that's absolutely true. I mean, we did a stream a little ways back about artists and mental health. And we were saying, I was talking to Alex Rowe, who's a teaching artist at ArtProf, that one of the reasons why I think a lot of artists do struggle with mental health is that you are cooped up in a studio by yourself, working on your stuff. I mean, you have to log a lot of time just by yourself working on your stuff. And I have always told people like, look, even if I had tons and tons of money and I never had to teach, I would still teach because it gets me out of the studio. I can talk to artists. I can have that interaction. I find that absolutely really important for me. Maybe some people it wouldn't bother them as much, but for me, I know that that's very, very important. Okay, let's take a look at some techniques that you guys could maybe employ because a lot of people, they get all of the drafting tools, right? They're like, oh, compass and ruler and T-square and blah, blah, blah. Like I am like allergic to rulers. Like I cannot do it at all. Like I just freak out anytime I have to measure anything. It's really, really bad. Like I, I'm so, well, I would say thank goodness for the world that I did not become an architect because that would have been a disaster. I probably would have failed at architecture school. <laughs> like it's really that bad. So I actually tell people don't, use a ruler. You can eyeball it, but sometimes, especially if you're doing a really big drawing, and if you're doing one that has two-point perspective, sometimes it's really hard because the vanishing points are like so far apart and the drawing's so big that it's just impossible. Like even if you had a ruler, it would be really, really hard to do. So the scale thing is an issue as well. So this is what I like. This is my favorite technique. This is the most amount of measuring that I will do. And it's not even really measuring. So what I do is I take a push pin and the push pin becomes the vanishing point. And then I take some string and I tie the string around the push pin. And then you just pull the string out. And it's awesome because you can just like move the string up and down. You can move it to the left, which is basically what Magneto did <laughs> in X-Men First Class because I'd forgotten about this scene on the upper left image. This is his like stocking board because he's like hunting Kevin Bacon and he's like got all these maps and so he's got all these strings and pushes. I was like, that looks just like what I do in class with my students when I'm trying to fix their linear perspective drawings. So the photo on the bottom, that's not me. That's actually Kat Huang, who is a teaching artist here at Art Prof. And she's working with one of my students because when my students had this just wonderful scene of like a dinner table and all these people and there were like dressers and cabinets around and the perspective, it just was so wrong. And so I said to Kat, I was like, Kat, go do some linear perspective surgery. And so we got out the push pins, we got the string, we taped it, we measured everything, we redrew it and it was so much easier. So I would say you guys, if you like rulers, fine, but I think this is much, much faster and more flexible because I feel like the ruler's just slow. Like you have to really take your time to use it and the push pen is fast. It's really a nice system. Okay, so here's the thing. Now I have given you some of the basics, vanishing points, vanishing lines, horizon line, but the question remains, how do we get to this nice cozy chess game? <laughs> with Professor X and Magneto. How do we insert ourselves into that scene? Because it's a big leap. Like, how do you go from this very technical, measured, blocky, abstract concept into something that actually has feeling and a story? If you guys have ideas for how you think that could happen, jump in the chat, let me know. Of course, I've got my own ideas, but I love hearing from you guys. I, I have to say, we have the best audience. You guys have such good comments and it's really inspiring. So keep telling me your thoughts or ask me questions. I'm happy to help you guys with that. This is my solution. 
you have to look for linear perspective in your everyday life. And that is the mistake that I think a lot of people don't do when they are learning linear perspective. Because so often, in fact, my daughter told me this because she was taking an art class in middle school and the teacher was teaching them one point and two point perspective. And it occurred to me after I listened to her describe what the lesson was like that she never told them what it looks like in real life. It basically was like a geometric system that she had them, okay, draw the horizon line, draw this and connect this and everything. It's like she couldn't make the connection between what that actually looked like in real life. And so I think what a lot of people do is they'll have students just make that chart that I have in the upper left. And they'll say, okay, now you know where everything is. Make this and turn these into buildings and add windows and do all that stuff, okay? You can do that. I just think that your understanding of what linear perspective actually is and what it's capable of is so much deeper if you learn where to see it. You cannot draw something if you can't identify it in real life. And so this is what I do. When I teach linear perspective, I actually do not have my students draw right away. The first thing we do is I take them to space. Usually it's a library because libraries have like all these big, long bookshelves and it's like perfect for linear perspective. And I just say to them, just walk around, just look. Look at the shelves, look at the space, don't draw, don't do anything else. And honestly, a lot of people don't do that nowadays. I mean, everybody's in such a rush, myself included, that I don't think that people look that carefully at a lot of things. And actually, now that I think about it, drawing is one of the few opportunities where you really sit and look at something for a very long period of time. So the thing is, then what I do after I have them walk around, I say, okay, guys, take your cameras, your phone, and just walk around and take as many photos as you can that you think show one point perspective. And it's really cool because I think with a camera, it's a little bit more accessible because people are taking photos all the time. It's much faster so they can walk like all around the space and take all different points of view and everything. And so the speed of that is very good. And then they have just a whole roster of images that are of one point perspective. So those are two things I have them do before they even pick up a pencil to start drawing. And it's very helpful. So if you look at this, I mean, this is my everyday life. <laughs> my everyday life is like a crit wall at an art school, but this has a linear perspective in it. I mean, if you look at this image, you guys can see there's the horizon line. You can see the artwork on the wall has linear perspective in it. It's all in there. It's just, you need to take the time to actually see it. Like if you guys are walking down the street and you pass by an alleyway, look down that alleyway and see the one point linear perspective in that alleyway. That's how you get to understand this stuff. Okay, so what you need to do, you need to see linear perspective in real life and you need to sketch it from real life. So here is what I think Matt Cross said earlier in the chat about eyeballing it because a lot of people are taught to just connect the dots and make those geometric systems. But I say to my students when we do linear perspective, you know what, we're just gonna do thumbnail sketches, quick little gesture drawings of the space. And they look at me like, what? This is architecture. We can't do gesture drawings of architecture. Architecture is supposed to be measured. It's supposed to be precise. I'm like, I don't care. Just give me the quickest way you can sum up what is happening here with the space. And so part of teaching linear perspective is actually de-emphasizing it a little bit. So when we go to those spaces, sure, I want them to look for the linear perspective, but in the end, I say to them, guys, it's just an approximation, okay? In the end, the only thing that matters to me is the illusion of space. And the illusion of space is not about 0.31% this way. It's just about the suggestion of that space. So you wanna see things in real life or, or, there's a lot of Michael Fassbender movies out there. However, some of them are better than others. Some of them, he's like in a forest half the time. Actually, I was hoping there'd be some stuff in Jane Eyre because he's in that big like Gothic mansion, but there isn't because it's all like chiaroscuro, like very dramatic lighting. But I like this bar scene because it has a checkerboard floor. And you know, you sort of wonder 
in the Renaissance, like, why does everybody have a checkerboard floor? Oh, because they were obsessed with linear perspective. And the checkerboard floor was like super easy, like instant linear perspective. So that's actually, I think, probably one of the reasons that they did that. Okay, so what I usually do, here, here are my really quick steps for how to start drawing linear perspective from life. It's the opposite of what a lot of people think it should be. Because a lot of people will look at a space and they'll say to themselves, okay, well, everything starts at the vanishing point. I got to find the vanishing point first. And so they, they try to find it and it's horrible. <laughs> you never can, it's impossible. So what I do is I say to the students, just draw a bunch of scraggly lines where you think you see vanishing lines, just approximate. You can always go back and fix it later on. And usually you end up with something that looks sort of like that. It looks really crappy and it, it looks like nothing's gonna happen. But the thing is, once you start adjusting and changing things, you find it eventually. Like as soon as you have like three vanishing lines, that's usually enough to figure out where the vanishing point is and the horizon line is, and then you start putting in, for example, some of those vertical parallel lines, and then it just takes care of itself. So I just think that people are overthinking this and that it doesn't have to be so mechanical and that you have to think about linear perspective like in life, because how are you supposed to make this convincing if it's just a bunch of cubes that you measure? Like, I don't find that helpful and it's so boring. Oh my God, not, not fun. Or you can go look at some Vermeer paintings because who does not need that in their life? Because Vermeer, like a lot of those Renaissance painters, I mean, there were so many like tiled floors and window panes and actually linear perspective is the one time when I'm sort of happy there's a brick pattern <laughs> because a lot of the times people don't want to paint the brick. But brick pattern is really great because it's all vanishing lines. It's like, you've got your verticals, you got your vanishing lines, it's fabulous. So that's the only time that a brick pattern really, I think, can be very helpful. Anyway, guys, I hope this was helpful. Let me know in the chat and in the comments if you would like to have videos on two-point perspective, on three-point perspective, because I'm happy to do all that stuff. I just wasn't sure what the interest level was. So tell me in the chat in the comments if you'd like to see that. And I hope you guys will explore our other related videos. We've got another fast bender video on lighting and shadow. We also have a portrait video on Benedict Cumberbatch. And that if you would like to continue to grow as an artist, you will subscribe to our channel and ringing the bell to make sure you don't miss out on anything. And thank you so much to our wonderful top Patreon supporters who make all of this possible. And thank you to all of you who, who contributed in the chat. This was really great. I'll see you guys next time. Bye.